I'm Axel Villamil, and I'm a creator and an innovator. Picture this. It's 2011 at the University of Toronto, and it's Frosh Week. And you see hundreds of students, they're, they're running around, they're making new relationships, lots of new friends. And one of the biggest icebreaker questions was, what's your major? So I tell them, and my major was computer science and new media studies. And the reaction was more like, ooh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> and then we have the other one and that's, uh, oh, that's really different. Those are a lot of, very two different things. I don't know about that. And um, before you judge them, let me tell you what my day-to-day -day looked like. So on one hand, I'd be studying computational complexity and learning about push-down automatons and context-free languages in my computer science class. All right? And then the hour after, I'm learning about post-feminism in Tarantino's universe of Kill Bill. So if you didn't know, huge contrast. And, you know, I listened to these people. I listened to these colleagues of mine who were saying, you're all over the place. And the more I listened, it started to trickle down in my life, not just from university, but to the social groups I hung out with, to my mentors telling me I need to focus down, and you know, right down to that social media bio that you have, where you've got to fit in you know, a little couple words here and there, and that defines you. And the problem with me was I had all these things and a couple more that I loved. I had all these different interests. The last one's real, by the way. Um, <laughs> But the, the thing was I, I was, I felt anxious, I felt weird, I felt like I had too many things going on, and I was confused as to why I didn't have this thing that every talk, everybody talked about, which was purpose, and you know, I was upset about it. And it was just this one true meaning, it was this purpose, purpose. And purpose, 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 I listened to it a lot because it came you know, in the media, in Hollywood. And we look at people like, you know, I'll say Justin Bieber, and we're gonna think famous singer. You know, I'll put up Angelina Jolie, and we're gonna tie her to being an amazing actress. And right after, Michael Jordan, amazing athlete. But I noticed one thing, that they died one skill set to them. You know, and I thought hard and realized, why wasn't I like that as well? So I broke it down. You know, I thought about media. I broke it down to the point where I said, okay, the media's job is for them to actually feed you a story as quick and easy as possible. So, you know, I started to calm down. I felt a little happier. I was like, wow, okay, maybe this is just media hype programming me. And then the clouds started to fade away. And then I looked in the clouds and I saw like this little like dot coming through and it came closer and closer and then boom, it was a slipper at my head because that was my mom's slipper for why don't you get the P word? And what's the P word, immigrant children out there? PhD. Why aren't you specialized in this thing? Why aren't you in a PhD, especially in the STEMs? Like, so, I'm Filipino, so it sounds more like this. Honey, <laughs> how come you're not doctor? <laughs> or a lawyer, or engineer, accountant. You know, your cousin Rhea, she's doctor. <laughs> and, um, you know, your last name, you're Mr. Billamil, and how come you can be Dr. Billamil? You know, but you have a lot, so let's focus down. Let's focus it down. And I'm like, focus down? I'm like, let's focus. Oh, focus down. And I'm like, sure, let's, let's focus down. But I didn't want to because I had all these different interests, you know, and I was, I was sad about it. But I want to break this down in wonderful startup jargon as to why immigrant culture thinks like that. So you have one to two CEOs in your entire life, your parents, okay? So these CEOs, they had this awesome, awesome idea. They're like, I'm gonna have a startup, which is their life, and they have this really cool product. You know what the product is? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> it's you, it's you. They, they love this thing, they cherish it, they put a lot of hard time and work, and they wanna see it succeed in the market. So, so what do they do? We're gonna put it in a place where it's going to have a lot of opportunity. So they moved to Canada. <laughs> and not maybe knowing a lot of English or having all the resources or the support, and they're starting in the red before even beginning on this crazy journey, which was crazy, by the way, but they did it. So a round of applause to all the immigrant families out there. 
so they're here, not with a lot of support, and what did they do? They did odd jobs, worked sleepless nights, graveyard shifts, anything they could to support you, their product, and make you succeed. And they were tired. And we all noticed that, especially as children. We always noticed. But they weren't dumb either. They looked around, they looked at the market, and they realized that there were these other CEOs with different jobs, which were the doctor and the lawyer. And their products also became doctors and lawyers. And that was them succeeding. And they didn't have to do all these odd, do odd jobs. So life was easy, and they wanted the same thing for their product. So that's why they pushed us so hard to that PhD. They pushed us so hard to becoming that doctor, lawyer, or something in the stems, because that's what they saw as survival. But you know what? I was still I'm like, that didn't help at all for me to think about it like that. But I started to compare myself, not to my cousin Rhea, but more to my friends who started at the same time as me. I had friends who started film, and now they're the DP for Drake's God Plan. And I had a friend who started dance at the same time with me, and she, he's with Janet Jackson dancing on stage. And I was so happy for them, and I loved it. But I couldn't help to compare myself as to why wasn't I at this peak of success like they were. But I started to think, is it all the different things I did and I was jumping around? And it hurt, and it sucked. But I came across this amazing illustration by Professor Matthew Might from the University of Utah. So what he wanted you to do was imagine this circle. And this circle had all the human knowledge in it, OK? And what he did was say, you're going to color in a bit of it. And that is what you learn in elementary. You know, your shapes, your numbers, and you go to high school. High school happens, you increase that circle just a little bit more, and from those shapes become geometry, and from those numbers become arithmetic. And then you get to your bachelor's around more, and you have a little bubble, which you specialize just a little bit in. And then you get to the masters, where it just starts with this cone shape that protrudes out to the very end. And it's like, it's like reaching for that thing, the P word. And all the research papers go by, and you, you reach that pinnacle. And so, zoom in, boom, you hit that mark. And two years or more, you make that little piece of impact on that PhD, and you're a specialist in this thing, and you break the boundary of human knowledge, which is awesome. But the great thing about this illustration is that he zooms all the way back out, and he shows you the comparison of what that specialization is versus what's left over. There's so much more knowledge. And I thought that was amazing. Still didn't, still didn't help me. <laughs> I, I went back to his illustration, and I went to where I was. Sorry, Mom. Didn't get the P word. But I looked at, this is where I stood. And then I thought about all my other skills. And I'm like, wait, we're forgetting more things. So it looked a little more like this. And then I realized my friends who were on these God plan, God's Plan music videos and Janet Jackson's, they were still at the very end because they specialized. And I, I started to think about my entire way of living and thinking that I was wrong for having so many different interests. This phrase came to mind. Doer of all, master of none. And that really resonated with me in a negative way. You think that's mean in English? Here we go. Japanese. Many talents is no talent. <laughs> no, 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 no. Estonian. Boom. Nine trades, the tenth one hunger. <laughs> that one was the most savage. And then after Spanish, you know, you aim for everything but hit nothing. I was like, okay, the entire world's against me. <laughs> so I looked more into this doer of all master of none. I'm like, who's this person? Who, who started this thing? I Googled like that. And I actually found out that it was started in the 1600s and that people are actually forgetting a very important part of this phrase, where the original phrase was this, doer of all, master of none, but oftentimes better than master of one. Mmm. Mm, I had this, this sliver of hope, and I'm like, yes, that's it. You know, a slipper's not going to hit me this time, but like, you know, I'm holding on to it. And I took this idea and thought about this whole meaning of life on being one, having one purpose. And I don't think it worked like that. And there's a set of people that are out there. You may be very much one of them, and I call them generalists. 
who have many interests and very many talents in many things. So I have a hypothesis about generalists. They're very innovative. So let me tell you a story about what happened in Japan. In the 1980s, there was a bullet train that just started. And as it's coming out the tunnel at the very exit, all the sound waves actually compressed. So when it exited, it made this huge sound, and it sounded so loud, and residents hated it. They needed to fix that, so they hired this guy named Eiji Nakatsu. What Eiji was, was a generalist. And what did he love? It was bird watching. He mixed engineering and bird watching together, which is something called biomimicry. And he used the beak of a kingfisher and modeled it after the head of the train. Not only did he fix the sound issue, he was also making the train 10% faster and 15% less on electricity. Another person you might know, DJ Grandmaster Flash. Yeah, he invented Scratch because he had a passion for technology and music. So rather than letting the technology play the record, he played the technology, spinning it in a unique solution. So I got to thinking, I was like, wow, there's so many people out there that are actually synthesizing their talents. And I gave it a try. I went and did it. I love dance so much, and I love computer science so much, and film and media. And I got together with some friends and some colleagues from U of T, and we created StageKeep which is actually helping choreographers by combining technology together and letting them visualize their performances. And it went so far that we got on Dragon's Den, and we sold to the Raptors for a license and are now working with them. And we even got choreographers who are interested, who actually choreograph for Drake, Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, and more. And I was like, wow, this is the power of synthesizing your solutions. So, when you look at this generalist graph, or this illustration of all these different talents, you should never be scared because you, all you need to do is bring them together. And once you bring them together, that little PhD, that's knowledge. But what you bring together is creating innovation. So if you are a generalist out there and you have so many people against you, so many people telling you that you can't do it just because it's different or it hasn't been done before, I want to remind you that it's not crazy at all, because it's only crazy until you do it. Thank you.